This algebraic geometry lecture will mostly be about Grassmannians. So in the last lecture, we looked at the Grassmannian G22, which can be thought of as two-dimensional subspaces of a four-dimensional vector space or alternatively lines in space. And now we're going to say a little bit about more general Grassmannians, G, M, N, which are maps, injective maps from K, M to K, M plus N. And much of the theory of Grassmannians GMN looks like the theory of the Grassmannians G22, only there's more bookkeeping going on. Um, in particular, we can show that the Grassmannian GMN is contained in a projective space of dimension M plus N choose M minus 1. So for G22, this would be 4 choose 2 minus 1, which is P5. So how do we do this? Well, the details, suppose given some um, m-dimensional subspace of the vector space Km plus n. What we do is we pick m vectors spanning it. Um, which gives a matrix of size um, m times m plus n. So we, we might have a vector um, with points a1 up to a m plus n, b1 up to b m plus n, and so on. Where these are the coordinate, where each row form the coordinates of one of these points. Um, and now we pick any M columns. So here we have M rows. We might pick M columns and look at the determinant of these columns. So this is just an m by m, the determinant of an m by n minor of this large matrix. Um, so you remember last time for G22, we just had two rows and we just picked two columns and gave that the, the determinant. So this gives us m plus n choose m um, numbers because this is the number of ways of picking m columns from this. And let's call these numbers p um, i1 up to i m, if we picked columns i1 up to i m. So we've got a large number of numbers p i, and these give you a point in p m plus n choose m minus 1. Um, there's a more um, abstract way of doing this. Suppose we've got a vector space v contained in a vector space w where v has dimension m and w has dimension m plus n. What we can do is we can take the nth exterior power of v, and this then maps to the nth exterior power of w. Well, the nth exterior power has dimension equal to 1, and the nth exterior power of w has dimension m plus n m. So, 
Whenever we've got an m-dimensional subspace of an m plus n-dimensional space, we get a one-dimensional space inside this, this larger dimensional space. And a one-dimensional subspace of something just corresponds to a point of the projector space of this um, vector space here. In other words, this is just the set of lines of this. So this is an abstract way of getting from a point of the Grassmannian to a point of projective space. Um, well, of course, this map isn't onto the whole of projective space. We need some Plucker relations. Well, the Plucker relations look like this. We get that naught is sum over lambda of minus one to the lambda of pi one up to i m minus one j lambda times p j one to j lambda minus one j lambda plus one j m plus one. So where the columns are where you pick m columns here and m columns here. So, so this is again a lot of of quadric relations. And um, again, this cancels out because every monomial occurs twice with opposite signs. And the proof of this is like the case when M and N are two, only there's a lot more bookkeeping to do. Um, again, um, we can then check that these are all the relations you need. So we need that the, the map from uh, G, M, N to the zeros of the Plucker relations is onto, and I'll just very quickly sketch the proof of this. The idea we can assume that say um, P one to M is equal to one by changing coordinates if necessary. Then we can find a point of the Grassmannian with um, with given values of um, p one opta r minus one r plus one. M S, in other words, at least M minus one indices in the set one to M um, by choosing a matrix whose left columns form the identities. But then the Plucker relations determine all the other P's. Um, um, so that's enough to show that the map from the Grassmannian to the solutions of the Plucker equations is actually on to. Um, so there are several applications of Grassmannians. Um, first of all, Grassmannians are given, um, have a covering by affine spaces, just as uh, we did for G22, it's very similar. Um, and these can be used to um, work out the cohomology of the Grassmannians. Cohomology groups also have a product on them. Um, the product of the Grassmannian, cohomology of the Grassmannians turns out to be rather complicated. It's given by something called the Littlewood Richardson rule. 
um, which I'm not going to give explicitly, but you can look it up on Wikipedia. So the Littlewood Richardson rule is really, well, it's really several different things. There are lots of different ways of looking at it, but one way of looking at it is it gives you the product of the cohomology of Grassmannians. Um, um, Grassmannians also turn up in something called the uh, line complexes. Um, so line complexes are um, certain varieties with a very rich structure. For instance, the quadrate line complex is given by, um, well, you take the Grassmannian G22, which you think of as being a subset of P to the 5, and you just intersect G22 with a quadric. So this uh, G22 is four dimensional. So if you intersect it with a random quadric in P5, this gives you a three dimensional variety called a quadric line complex. And you can get things like cubic line complexes by replacing it with a cubic and so on. If you've got the book Griffiths and Harris on algebraic geometry, you may notice that the final chapter is entirely about the quadric line complex. Um, the fourth place Grassmannians turn up is their quotient. So the Grassmannian GMN is a quotient of the group GL M plus N over K. Um, so the group G, L, M plus N of K acts transitively on the M-dimensional subspaces, and the subgroup fixing one M-dimensional subspace is a sort of block form looking like this, where um, these blocks are M by M, and this is M by N, and this is M by N, and this is N by M. Um, so... They are homogeneous spaces, a quotient of some group by some subgroup. Notice, by the way, that this group here is affine. It's an affine variety, therefore an affine algebraic group. This group here is also affine. And you might guess that if you take the quotient of an affine group by an affine group, you get an affine variety, but you don't. In general, the variety may be affine, but GMN is a projective variety, so it can sometimes be a projective variety. So this shows that the problem of taking quotients of algebraic groups by other algebraic groups is rather more complicated than you might guess, because um, affine modulo affine doesn't always give you affine. Um, in fact, the quotient of two affine varieties doesn't have to be either affine or um, projective. So, for example, suppose we take k squared minus the point zero, 0. So this variety is neither affine nor projective. It's just a plane minus a point, so it's not a closed subset of the plane. And there's just no way to make this into an affine variety or a projective variety. However, the group GL2 of K acts transitively on it, and the subgroup fixing a point is just the group of all matrices like this, which is just an affine line. So here we have another quotient of an affine group by an affine group, and it's bit of a mess. It's neither affine nor projective. So whatever, it's, it's actually an example of something called a quasi-affine variety, an open subset of an affine variety. Um, so another application, um, I forgot what number I've got up to, but so never mind, is um, it's used by Grothendieck in a construction of a Hilbert scheme.
OK, we haven't actually defined schemes yet, so I'm going to have to um, fudge a little bit. Um, the idea of a Hilbert scheme is it parameterizes subschemes of projective space. Well, what does that mean? Well, you take the coordinate ring of projective space. And you look at graded ideals of this ring. So the graded ideal is going to be I0 plus I1 plus I2. Well, I0 will, of course, just be zero. Otherwise, the closed subset you get is not terribly interesting. And you want to classify um, so subschemes sort of correspond roughly to graded ideals of this ring here. So what you really want to do is to classify graded ideals of this ring, and in particular, you'd like to show that graded ideals correspond to points of some projective um, um, schemes. Um, so, um, so roughly speaking, you would like to be able to construct um, a point of projective space from an ideal like this. Well, how are you going to do that? Well, we will see later that the dimension of I n is a polynomial in n. Sorry, that shouldn't be in n. Let's call it I j. Is a polynomial in j for j large. It's more or less something called a Hilbert polynomial that we will be talking about quite a lot later. And suppose I d generates i d plus 1, i d plus 2, and so on. So OK, one problem is we have to find a d with that property, which is a technical problem I'm not going to talk about. Then i d is a subspace of s d, which is all um, degree d monomials. Well, here we've got a subspace of a vector space, so we get a point of the Grassmannian um, of subspaces of this dimension contained in subspaces of this dimension. So it's a rather large and complicated Grassmannian. Um, and the Grassmannian is itself a projective variety in some even larger projective space. So um, we've managed to construct points of projective space from graded ideals. And this is a very large projective space, obviously. I mean, this Grassmannian is a pretty large Grassmannian, and embedding Grassmannians in projective space makes them even bigger. So this is a rather huge construction. Um, And um, um, so um, um, the, the next question is, uh, what does natural mean? So what we want to do is to say the points, so the lines in um, three-dimensional projective space correspond to the points of a Grassmannian um, 2, 2, which is a certain subvariety in P5. And this correspondence is natural. And what do we mean by this? I mean, notice that in some sense, it's trivial to find a variety whose points correspond to lines in P3. All we need to do is to take any variety with the same cardinality of that, and we get a one-to-one -one correspondence. Well, that, that's kind of stupid. We want to have a correspondence that makes sense. And it's not at all clear how you, defi what you, how you define that this correspondence is natural. And this was answered by Groth and Dick. So what Groth and Dick did was he look at functors from commutative rings.
these the rings r. So we can take various functions. We can take r to the set of lines in projector space over the ring r. Or we can take another functor r, which takes r to g to 2 over the ring r. In other words, certain two-dimensional projective subspaces of r to the 4 that split uh, as two-dimensional. Or we can take r to the r-valued points of, say, a quadric given by the Plucker relation p naught 1 p2 3 minus something plus something equals naught in p5. Um, and Grothendieck's way of saying that the lines in p3 correspond naturally to the r value points of this quadric sa says that these three are isomorphic as functors. So this has the extra condition that, that if we call these functors f and g, not only are f, r, and f, and g are isomorphic as sets, but also um, these isomorphisms are compatible with morphisms from R to S. So, so if we've got a, the key point is this, suppose we've got a homomorphism of rings R to S, then we've got maps FR to FS, and FR is isomorphic to G of R, and we've got a map from GR to G of S, and these are isomorphic. And the point is all these diagrams here should commute. Um, so in order for this to make sense, you need to work with general commutative rings R. It's not really enough to work um, just, for, just for projective space over fields. Um, more generally, Grothendieck showed that any scheme is defined by its functor of points. Um, so this means that if we've got, a, for instance, a scheme might be three-dimensional projective space. And that means we've got a functor which takes any ring R to three-dimensional projective space over the ring R, which is actually a little bit tricky to define. We'll talk about this later. Um, and this is a very powerful construction because you can find various functors like the, the, the Picard group of a variety or a Hilbert scheme of projective space or an isomorphism class of abelian varieties over a ring. And these will all be functors. You can then ask, are, do these correspond to schemes? Um, um, so the next lecture will be on a few more examples of projective varieties.